This is the Create Your Own Life show, where we interview people that are world-class performers, from Super Bowl champions to New York Times bestsellers to billionaires. We figure out what makes them tick and unpack it for you to do the same. I'm Jeremy Ryan Slate, and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we help you to create your own life. out there jeremy here and uh it's thursday it is the 11th of august 2022 and welcome to your create your own life show i have a really interesting episode in store for you today and uh one i'm really interested to share with you for for very specific reasons as if you've listened to the show for a long time i've talked about really what this show stands for and one of the things is we have a very strong stance against psychiatric drugging. I'm not going to say that there aren't some, you know, issues out there that, that exist that people do need help with, but I don't think drugs are the way to handle those. And there was something that came up very recently on an episode of Tucker Carlson that I wanted to share with you and actually reached out to get an expert because of. So I'm going to share a clip with you, and then I'm going to tell you about the episode that we have that I have in store for you um, today. Now, drug makers admit that their products may be part of the reason for the increase in suicide. The makers of Prozac, for example, concede that young people who take that drug have an increased risk of suicide compared to those who took a placebo. Think about that for a second. A drug that's supposed to make you less sad may make it more likely that you will kill yourself. How is that allowed? Well, it's been allowed because virtually no one has said a word about it. One person who did say something about it a long time ago was the actor Tom Cruise. All the way back in 2005, he had a very famous appearance on the Today Show. You may remember it. Here it is. Here we are today where I talk out against drugs and psychiatric abuses of electric shocking people, mm -hmm. okay, against their will, of drugging children with them not knowing the effects of these drugs. Do you know what Adderall is? Do you know Ritalin? Do you know now that Ritalin is a street drug? Do you understand that? Aren't there examples, and might not Brook Shields be an example of someone who benefited from one of those drugs? All it does is mask the problem, Matt. And if you understand the history of it, it masks the problem. That's what it does. That's all it does. You're not getting to the reason why. There is no such thing as a chemical imbalance. Drugs aren't the answer. That these, these drugs are very dangerous. They're mind-altering, antipsychotic drugs. And there are ways of doing it without that so that we don't end up in a brave new world. So Cruz said a few things. One, maybe you shouldn't trust the pharma companies and just hand your children whatever they're producing and hope for the best. Two, there's no such thing as a chemical imbalance in your brain that causes depression. He said that. And three, these drugs mask the real problems. You're suffering for a real reason that drugs can't fix. Provocative statements. How did the country respond to this? Well, everyone in the media agreed. Tom Cruise is crazy. He's in a cult. Shut up. A lot of people thought that. We may even have thought that. So for those of you watching the video, I'll get a little bit more out of this. But basically, the reason I wanted to set that up is a lot of people said, you know, Tom Cruise is crazy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And there was a lot of research that came out recently basically showing he was right, that there is no such thing as a chemical imbalance in the brain. And I didn't want to be the one to say that since I don't have the credentials. I don't have the background. So I went out and found somebody that does. And our guest today is Dr. Toby Watson. He's a clinical psychologist. He has testified before Congress. He's testified before the Senate. He has testified before the FDA. So he has the clout to talk about this. He also was one of the main psychologists working in the Department of Prisons in um, the state of Wisconsin. So he's got a big background in this, and I wanted to kind of learn a lot more about the science behind it. Rather than just you get my opinion, I wanted to share with you some information from somebody that I got a chance to learn from. So I reached out through some people I know. To, to try and find out like who would be the best person to get information from. And Dr. Toby Watson was a great source. There's a lot of great information in this interview. And I, I wanted to share this with you 
Um, since this has been a topic in the news recently, and it's been something I've talked about before, you know, this show is not for psychiatric drugging. I think there's other ways that, that you know, people do need help, but there's other ways out there that we can do that. Uh, before we get into this episode, though, I want to shout out a couple great companies that made this episode possible. To our friends over at MyPillow, who right now are offering you up to 66% off of select products if you use my promo code, which is CYOL, over at MyPillow.com. Um, that's up to 66% off of select products. Also, shout out to our friends over at Audible, who right now are offering you a free audiobook download and a free month of their service. Um, I'm currently reading, and this is a very long book. I think it's like 40 hours, but I'm, I'm pretty far into it. I'm reading Washington by Ken Chertow. If you want to grab that book or any other book for free, courtesy of Audible, just head over to jeremyryanslate.com slash book. That is jeremyryanslate.com slash book. All right, and a reminder, if you haven't subscribed to the show yet, you can do so on YouTube, Rumble. There's a lot of people out there that have been subscribing on, on YouTube, so I'm grateful for that. But if you haven't, go out there and, and subscribe and share us with your family and friends. And uh, depends on where you're listening. If it's Apple Podcasts, if it's Spotify, you can do the same over there as well. All right, without further ado, let's get into this conversation with Dr. Toby Watson. Hey, what is up, everybody? Jeremy here. And guys, I'm very interested for the topic we're going to cover today um, because I, it's, I, I was watching an episode of Tucker Carlson Gosh, I think about two weeks ago. It's one. It's like literally the only television show I actually watch other than Yankees games. And uh, he had this whole segment on where he he played a clip from Tom Cruise from I think like ten plus years ago. I think it was like two thousand seven or something like that. And he went through this whole segment talking about Tom Cruise was right related to the kind of the the, the mental health issues we're dealing with in this country and you know a lot of the medication and things around that. And it really caught my attention, but I wanted to learn a lot more about it. So I, I reached out to different people I knew to try and find the right expert. Um, and previous guest to the show, uh, John Spagnola, connected me to um, our guest today, who is Dr. Toby Watson. He's a clinical psychologist. Um, he also works quite a bit in forensic psychology. He's testified uh, for many different court cases. He's also testified before the FDA. He's testified before the Congress and the Senate of Mexico. He's also formerly the head psychologist for the Department of Corrections for Wisconsin. So, uh, Dr. Watson, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Hey, wonderful to be here. So I, I want to know first and foremost, I know I kind of gave a brief explanation of your background, but I'd love to hear more about your expertise and kind of more of what's pulled you into kind of this topic, because you do have very specialized knowledge on it. Sure. Uh, and originally, I was uh, going into neuropsychology. Um, I was uh, trained out in California. And all of a sudden, as I started learning uh, more about research, and I was trained as a scientist practitioner. So I was very interested in research. And uh, so slowly, I started to change my opinion, where I really thought that, again, I believed in the idea of the chemical imbalance. I believe that you had to take medications for life, um, that these are brain disorders. And then slowly, a lot of the research didn't add up. And I started to become an expert in the research and realize how people can lie with statistics. And then that's when I started making the change. And I thought, you know, I don't think I want to go into this, you know, into that uh, area of the, the field. And so I went into clinical psychology then, um, ultimately opening up a nonprofit um, and then uh, running a, a clinic and then slowly started to become um, known for helping people at times uh, to reduce and or find uh, the minimum uh, amount of medication that they could be on, often getting people off medications. And that was something uh, a bit unheard of when you were doing that uh, roughly 20 years ago. And so that led me to working with a few celebrity clients, allowed me to you know, really help a few people that were high profile cases. And then at that point, um, you know, people started contacting me for forensic cases. And so I started doing a lot of uh, legal work. Uh, when bad things happen in the country, sometimes they'd hire me to basically go and do a file of autopsy and say, hey, look, I think that the medication here, which maybe was helpful in the short term, has actually started to cause the problem that we're seeing now, the acesthesia, the aggression, the violence, the murder or suicide. And, uh, and the courts are starting to listen to that now. It's it's interesting too. I read a book a number of years ago. Um, I think it was called Psychiatrist: The Men Behind Hitler. And um, and one of the people that um, that I actually had discovered the book from was a was a writer named Jim Mars, who wrote for the Dallas Morning News and and a lot of other things. And he talked about this this idea of even a lot of the school shootings, which we keep having more and more and more of these 
Like if you look into the history of a lot of the people, um, and you can speak to this more than I can, because I'm just kind of going off of, you know, a, a story that I heard, but a lot of it is connected right. to people being medicated and treated and institutionalized and things before these things happen, which to me seems a bit odd, right? If we're treating people for these, these things, shouldn't they solve these things? And that's we're, we're seeing yeah. more suicide associated with the drugs, more terrible actions associated with the drugs. So I guess like, why are we treating people with these these drugs? Like, what's kind of the the viewpoint behind it? Well, personally, I think that they're they're going down a, a bad road and the wrong path. But I do recognize, and talking with other colleagues, um, they look at it as the greater good. Yeah, you got to break a few eggs to make an omelet, and they're seeing it as yes. There's a lot of people that are helped by utilizing and taking these certain types of psychotropic medications, these mind-altering drugs. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, some people, you know, uh, start to cause violence and they start to do really, really um, inhumane things. Um, so they believe that, hey, more people are being helped than hurt. But I think it's not a matter of looking at the quantity and more of the quality. Um, we have these outliers when it does go bad, it goes extremely bad. And mm -hmm. you mentioned like school shootings. Um, we did a kind of an analysis um, and looked at school shootings and were able to basically look at the last 35 major uh, acts of violence where they had the school shootings. Every, every one of those shooters were taking or stopped taking a psychotropic drug known to cause suicidal ideation, aggression, uh, akesthesia and uh, mania or hypermania. So here you have a child who is already marginalized, who may be already uh, struggling with shame issues, who already is, you know, often we see as another static variable where they're doing gameplay or role play activities of violence. And now mm -hmm. you give them a medication that basically gives them a spellbinding effect, you know, to quote kind of Peter Bregan. Uh, it gives them kind of a, a zombie like effect. And then what you do is they start to get akesthesia. They start to get this inner restlessness that then starts to cause aggression. And then they start to have fantasies and they start to feel inhumane, depersonalized. So you've got this person now, the perfect cocktail to go out and kind of just randomly start shooting and to feel like the, you know, to try to feel alive or to try to get some vengeance. And, and really and then when you look at the videos of these uh, shooters, they often are very, just very numb, just very randomly just kind of going around. And that's why they call it kind of uh, like a zombie. You've cut off that part of their humanity and they're doing inhumane things. It's really interesting because I remember like that was the thing that came to mind for me. I remember the the Aurora, Colorado shooting. Uh, James Holmes, I believe, was the shooter there. And like you saw the photos of him and it, it just looked like it really looked like there was no one there. Right. It, and And that's Something I've heard before that a lot of these acts are they're doing these things just to feel sometimes because they've they've been numbed in a lot of ways. So I guess why would we be treating people with something that a lot of the side effects are actually the things they seem to be causing or not causing? Like like to me, like, you know, if you get a flat tire on a car, you change a tire, your problem solved. Yeah. Right. And in this yeah. case, like it doesn't seem to be solving the problem. So like so like what's kind of the thought process there? Right. Well, again, you'd have to look to them and talk to them. I can try to give you an understanding of what they're sure. thinking. And what they're thinking, I think on one level, if you're looking at the drug manufacturers, uh, you're talking about uh, upwards of 16 to $20 billion a year now um, of, uh, of sales. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about an, a massive amount of money coming in. And, uh, and so that's one main reason why they're doing it. Now, I don't want to say that they're, uh, that they're strictly evil, but we do recognize right. from a lot of these lawsuits that they hide data. They're not giving us doctors the data that we need to give it to a patient to make informed decisions. And that, I think, is a bit evil. When you hide data that you know can cause problems, that's a problem. And they're all, I shouldn't say all, but almost all of them um, are culpable of doing that. Uh, we've seen lawsuit after lawsuit. And it's only when there's these lawsuits do we actually start to uncover the magnitude of what they're doing. Um, one of my friends, Jim uh, Gottstein, attorney Gottstein, brilliant attorney, um, he was involved in involved in something. If you Google Zyprexia papers, you'll see Eli Lilly, you know, where they're basically hiding data um, about Zyprexia and what was happening with people taking Zyprexia and how people died because of it. And, uh, you know, a judge told him, no, you can't release this data after the lawsuit. You know, they settled. And a judge or uh, Jim Gottstein realized that this truly was um, criminal. 
And he said, no, you can't ask me to hide a crime and ultimately released the data. And I think it ran uh, at least a few days at the front page of the, of the New York Times in the, the health section. And I think uh, about a thousand lawsuits were filed within months after Jim released that from other families who had loved ones who had died or were severely hurt because of uh, Zyprexia and what happened. So I think the profit is one. You follow the money. We know this. We're Americans. We always get it. Right. Follow the money. You know, what, well, what which is, is Show interesting, me the money, too. Show me the if, money. You, <laughs> if you look at like, you know, I'm uh, like two of the largest, you know, settlements in, in you know, in U.S. history, you know, Glaxo. Uh, had a three billion dollar settlement. Pfizer had a two or two point three billion dollar settlement. These are like larger than a lot of companies will ever make, right? Like, there's companies right. that aren't going to make a billion dollars, and they paid that just out in settlements. So, correct. So, to me, that's a, that's a huge issue as well. That there's so much money in an industry like that. Absolutely, absolutely, and and there's more of these. I mean, you look at uh, Risperidone, another one where they were falsely marketing that. I think they paid four hundred million dollars just in New York, if I remember right. I think Wisconsin shared. Um, with another state, like about $70 million, if I recall. Um, and these attorneys, uh, I, I know like Scheller and Scheller, um, you know, very nice guys. Um, they're the ones who did against big tobacco and were mm -hmm. involved in that. Um, they, they've told me, they said, look, Toby, you know, this is the only way it's going to stop is if we keep coming after them in the pocketbooks. This is why you're not seeing as many new drugs come out as much anymore, because they, I think they realize that their time has come. Uh, or has been there and is starting to come to a passing now because people are starting to become wise to it, even though the fact that their sales are still going up, they're still rocketing. Um, but that's part of the false marketing, which, you know, is that idea of most Americans. It was a, a great study done not too long ago where they asked and surveyed Americans and said, do you believe that mental illness and what we call mental suffering is due to a chemical imbalance? And what, what percent do you think uh, of the American population thought that, yeah, it's due to a chemical imbalance? You want to take a guess? I'd say it's less than a third. No, no. It's over two-thirds. Really? Yeah. So it's the opposite. It's over two-thirds. Wow. 80% plus thought it was actually uh, due to a chemical imbalance. And this we knew wasn't true. I mean, as researchers, we've known it from the beginning, way back, you know, go back decades ago. We had uh, researchers who understood the idea. And this was where the idea came from. The idea was that, look, if I feel depressed, and I take something that increases serotonin, and then I report, hey, I feel better, ergo, maybe I had not enough serotonin. And that's kind of the idea of the chemical imbalance. But it was kind of just, hey, it could be other things too. We don't know. So I remember Jonathan Leo uh, and Jeffrey Lacoste, two researchers, um, they had published a paper, I think it was I think, uh, 2005, if I remember right, um, in PLOS. And it was called Serotonin and Depression, a Disconnect Between the Advertisement and the Scientific Literature. So this is going back to 2005. Now, this became a hot topic just recently because another one of our friends and colleagues over at uh, the University College of London, uh, Jonah Moncrief, who you know uh, has lectured at our conferences, and, and she's a brilliant researcher and professor there. She recently came out just about a month ago, and it's making shockwaves. This is what you know, uh, Charlie Kirk and and others you had mentioned too uh, have been talking about on their on their television shows and radio shows that this idea of a chemical imbalance has been completely abolished, completely disproven again with the world's largest study ever done looking at this by her, you know this researcher, and it's coming out saying, look, they've made billions and billions of dollars off this false notion. And they marketed it as if it was a true thing, that there was this chemical imbalance. The little ball that used to bounce, you know, the Zoloft ball going mm -hmm. across your screens. And, you know, your depression may be due to a chemical imbalance. Zoloft corrects this imbalance. Total false. Wow. And, and they've known it, and we've known it. We've had – and it's not just these researchers. We've had the, the you know, Ron Pies, director of Psychiatric Times, the professional journal, NIMH, National Institute of Mental Health. We've had – Every major institution talk about nobody actually really get, believed that it was a chemical imbalance, except for the public because of the marketing and advertising directly to them. And they've made an immense amount of money to it. So let me ask you this then, like if that's the case and like, you know, the, the I guess the, the scientific and medical public has known this for a long time, but, you know, the, the general population hasn't known this. Like to me, number one, there would be a culpability there, right? Like somebody's responsible for what has happened there is one part of it. Another part about it too is 
how do you change how do you get the real information to the public right because if you look at it um there there was a segment um the, one of my favorite podcasts is called the no agenda show and they play clips of the news um adam curry was the the first podcaster so he has a show called no agenda show and they played a clip of you know 50 different news stations it was like a two minute and 30 second clip you know sponsored by pfizer sponsored by pfizer sponsored by pfizer so if a lot of your information you're getting is sponsored by the companies that are that that the information is supposed to be reporting on. Yeah. Like it seems to me like you're kind of screwed. Like how do how does that even get out then? Well, and, and you're exactly right. And it's again follow the money. Um, that's one of the problems is that you know people will pull their commercials if you speak negatively about their products. Um, so Tucker Carlson, you know, doing this segment, you know, you're not going to see probably a Pfizer ad coming on, you know, anytime near his show. Right. Um, and same for researchers. So keep in mind, Jonah Moncrief, she's not getting funded by any drug company. Nobody's going to say to her, although they will offer her money. They will, mm -hmm. you know, maybe send her a message or I should say a, a letter saying, we love your research. We'd like you to come work for us. And you're never going to publish something ever against us ever again. Um, I remember David Stein, who used to be at uh, Longwood University. And then he was at the uh, University of Pennsylvania for a while, if I recall, uh, before he passed, he had told me, he said, yeah, I've, he wrote a few books. Uh, uh, one was talking back to Ridlin, I think, if I remember right, and there was a couple other ones. And he got the letter, you know, where he got offered a job at a pharmaceutical company. And the idea was, hey, we're going to give you this, we're going to give you this, and you can never publish again. And I've heard that from other researchers who wow. speak out against this. So they try to buy them up, and, and so that way they don't speak out. Um, yeah, I'm not a big enough fish to get a letter yet, so I, I'm not worried. <laughs> well, it's it's almost like the politician that gets gets the big signing bonus for a book that nobody wants to read uh, to, to to you know kind of grease their palms. But I guess based on that, then you know uh, a lot of the drugs that people are taking for depression for a lot of these issues are, are what's called um, SSRIs, and that stands for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And that goes along with the science you were just talking about of if we you know handle this chemical imbalance, which apparently doesn't exist, we handle the problem. So I guess if that's bunk science. Where, where does this go? Because there's a whole industry based on it. Uh, well, and that's exactly right. So, you know, Irvin Kirsch and uh, David Antonuccio, um, they had given testimony to the FDA back in 2004. And even back then, they said, look, we've done a, a meta-analysis. We looked at all of these studies. Um, there's 12 published random controlled studies out there um, that are looking at, you know, uh, antidepressants and looking at placebo, a sugar pill. And they said, what we're finding is that we can replicate the same lowering of depression in the sugar pill that you can with the antidepressant. So much so that me as a clinician working with somebody, you couldn't tell the difference. It's a few points on what we call a Hamilton D scale, a depression scale. And they said that we need to alert and let the public know that they're taking these medications, but it really is placebo. Now, granted that we know that if you believe something is going to work, it does cause a change in your brain. It's not just a belief. Belief is neurological and it is chemical. Mm -hmm. um, and so we know that we have a massive amount of people who are taking these antidepressants. And I'm not suggesting that somebody abruptly stop because it's very dangerous to start these and very dangerous to stop. So anyone listening to the, you know, to the, our talk shouldn't run out and say, oh, gee, I'm just going to stop. You talk to your doctor, you know, maybe start to consider something, you know, alternative or different, um, you know, than taking the antidepressant, but, you know, work with your practitioner to do that. But where we go from here is we realize that, okay, it's not due to a chemical imbalance. They're taking something that causes a chemical imbalance. It structurally changes your brain, causing a super sensitivity to being depressed. Because again, what's happening is you have, you know, your neurons, one neuron and you have the other neuron. One is releasing, you know, that serotonin out and, you know, it's blocking the reuptake, you know. And so it floods this synaptic cleft, you know, this area with extra serotonin and this thing fires more and you think that you're happy and then you think that's the reason why which we now know it's not really the case. But what happens is your brain says, oh, I'm firing too much. You've given me a drug that's making me fire more you know, with this uh, serotonergic system. So it starts to kill it off. It starts killing off the receptor sites and starts killing off the release sites. And it starts building more reuptake sites over here. So now if you remove the you know, reuptake blocking agent, Prozac, Paxil, effects her and you remove that you're making less it's vacuuming it up quicker and now this never fires 
And this is what happens and why people have become so suicidal potentially is because now what you've done is you've really depleted the system. And we've realized that that artificially, for whatever the reason, can make people potentially suicidal when they abruptly terminate coming off that medication. Um, or sometimes messing with that system and increasing it abruptly when they start it seems to be making them also more suicidal at that time. But interestingly, and this work that, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, Jonah Moncrief just showed when she did this massive study, they found that when you artificially, though, not through a drug, but otherwise, get rid of the building blocks of serotonin, just get rid of it so there's less serotonin, no difference in the depression. And when they wow. measured people and said, here you got a depressed group, here you have a non-depressed group, let's take a thousand people here and a thousand people here, and let's look at you know their, their levels of serotonin. No difference. Wow. And there's been others. I mean, Stephen Rose um, was another researcher, you know, more than uh, probably 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago now, again, looked at the same thing, came to the same conclusion. It wasn't as big as a study of what she did now, but they've known this again for decades. This is just the last nail in the coffin, I think, that is finally nobody can be in my field and say that they don't know that this is absolute, you know, BS. Well, this this leads me to a couple different things. I have like two pages of notes here already. Um, but like, yeah. um, have you ever seen the series The Sopranos by any chance? Oh yeah, I loved it. Okay, so I, I feel like in in I, I live in New Jersey, and I feel like everything relates to that. But there's the second episode in the series, um, where where Tony's sitting down with and and for those people that haven't seen The Sopranos, like the the kind of the the backstory of this is Tony Soprano, the lead character, the mob boss, like talks to the psychiatrist like every couple of weeks, and this is like mm -hmm. how you kind of find out more about his story. Well, anyway, in the second episode, he sits down after he's been on Prozac for like a day or two. And he says to her, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a better person. Like I'm doing these things. They're better. And she says to him, Tony, you've been taking it for two days. You're not going to see any difference in yourself for like two weeks. So it goes back to what you're saying about it. You know, yeah. just taking a sugar pill or something, you may see change in yourself, right? doesn't mean it's actually doing anything, which is quite yeah. interesting. It's just how you think about it is one part of it. But you mentioned as well, and, and I want to kind of look into this, the, the that there's changes to the brain that occur from these drugs. And I'm, I'm curious are these changes permanent? Like, do they actually change the structure permanently? Do they change the function permanently? And if so, is there anything we can do about it, like a detox or anything like that? Or how does that work, like to the to, to kind of that yeah. whole thing? Yeah, well, and, and that's where the research is now, because that's what, you know, well, that's what the research drug companies aren't focusing on. And they're not funding that to say, hey, is there a protocol for coming off medications? There's lots of protocols to get on meds and how you titrate up. But I don't think I've ever seen one that says this is how you titrate down and this is how you get off the medication. Because mm -hmm. the narrative now is, oh, no, you have this metaphorical illness. You know, It's an illness for life, and you should be medicated for life. And that's what doctors tell you. Um, you know, If you go into you know, see a doctor for any uh, mental health issue, you, you mention anything related to mental health whatsoever. And they did in a study. This was a friend of mine uh, who was uh, the president of the American Psychological Association back in the day, uh, Nick Cummings. He did this study and said, uh, okay, if you walk in, how many get referred out to a mental health therapist or a specialist, and how many just get put on a medication? And he, and he did this study, uh, if I remember, it was 1990. And at that time, it was 90% got referred out and 10% got put on a med right away. And that was it. So he replicated the study back in, I think it was 2000, and 10 years later. And in 10 years, what percent do you think got referred out to a specialist? And what percent do you think got put onto a medication? Want to take a guess? I, I don't have any idea because I was totally wrong last time. So I, I don't want to be wrong again. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be wrong again. I was the so, exact opposite of what actually was last time. So I feel like I'm yeah. going to say the wrong thing again. Of course. Yeah, it was 90% got put on a medication and 10% got referred out. It was the exact opposite wow. that happened. In 10 years, doctors felt so comfortable that they could just medicate and not have to refer to anybody and not send it off to a specialist. And again, keep in mind, 90 plus percent of all psychotropic meds are being written by general practitioners. You know, And a general practitioner on average you know, their training in, in, in psychopharmacology of psychiatric drugs is about 30 hours. Mm -hmm. So a really long weekend. And those are the people who are making the mass majority of people addicted to these drugs and, and, and you know, staying on these types of medications.
So, so I don't let think me answer your question, but <laughs> no, no, I, I so I, that makes sense. And I guess, but like, let me ask you this then, because like, if you look at like, and and I could this could be totally wrong, and I could just you know not be in the right direction of this. But you look at what pharma does; they're always kind of looking for the next gold rush, right? And I guess in, in this perspective, then, do you think that they kind of see the writing on the wall on this, and this is why we're seeing more people talking about you know gender dysphoria and you know hormones and all these other things? Is that like their next gold rush, or am I kind of looking in the wrong direction there? Um, well, uh, so I don't know where they're thinking the next gold rush is going to be okay. for the drug companies. I'm sure they've got lots of things up their sleeves. Um, you mentioned gender dysphoria, and for the audience that may not know that term, that used to be gender identity disorder. This is the new thing that we have, which yeah. is very you know controversial now, talking about I'm a, I'm a biological male by appendage, um, and I feel like a female, therefore everybody should treat me like a female. Um, that is one of the labels, uh, disorders, an illness that is listed in our book, uh, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which back in the day, and I have all the copies from back in the day, it used to be about this big, and now it's about this big, and we have over, I think, 800 and some subtypes and, and labels that we can give. Keep in mind, we have our own book, the DSM, for all mental stuff. It's, it's like DSM-5 the... or something like that now? Is that what they're up to yeah, on that? Yeah, we're at DSM-5 now. And the real diseases were like cancer and diabetes and you know ulcers and things that are true medical illnesses are in a physician desk reference. That's the medical book of real disease. We have a book of metaphorical diseases, which are different. The desktop of medical diseases are discovered. We discover cancer, we discover this, we, we discover all these things. And if you have cancer here, you have it in Japan. If I have diabetes here, it's diabetes there. We have certain cutoff scores, they're consistent and absolute. Our book started off this small and got to this big because we made up the diseases. There were no actual patient. It was a group of people like myself who sat around and said, you know what? I don't really you know, think that you know, kids who squiggle in their seat and do this and this, I don't think we like this as a society. So let's create a, a show of hands. We're gonna call it something and we're gonna make up this disease. And we're gonna just subjectively come up with, you know, uh, well, you mentioned Sopranos. <laughs> you might remember this episode. For humanity, the only way to restore humanity is humanity. Love, empathy, compassion, play, laughter, um, art expression through dance and music and you know and painting and clay and and getting back to being grounded in, in mother earth so the idea is that you've got to tap back into those parts of your psyche and your humanity and bring meaning to it so mm -hmm. if you're suffering emotionally yeah somebody who's telling you like i want you to stay away from all those feelings who says hey you've got to keep pushing that out of your mind which sometimes can be helpful you know more behavioral and cognitive behavioral things can work but if you've gone through the gamut you might need to really work with somebody who's a little bit more analytical somebody who's really going to dive and amplify that more get to the root meaning of what's really going on how deep does that rabbit hole go and you know how you know, how can you express that feeling? Obviously, you have to maintain safety and things at the same time and, and structure. But we know like exercise, nutrition, nutrition by itself is mammoth. Yeah. So there are some good studies done, um, and I have some of this on my website. People can go there; they can read anything I say. It's backed up by science and research. So if somebody says, "Oh, this guy's a whack," <laughs> feel free. But go to the website. You can read and understand why I'm saying the things that I'm saying because there's research to back it up, which is you know, drtobywatson.com. But if you look at the studies, just if I go into any clinic anywhere across the country right now, and I walk in and I say, what percentage of the people who are being treated here actually have medical conditions that mimic a psychiatric condition? You'll find about 17% of that group, those patients, truly have medical conditions. And when they've done these studies over and over and over again, and they treat the medical condition because they haven't tested for it and done a full gamut, when they treat the true medical condition, guess what? The psychiatric issue goes away. Or is well, significantly and, and that's minimized. really interesting too, because I had a friend that um, they had all of these things wrong with them. Like they were, you know, feeling depressed. They were having, um, you know, these different like brain fog issues and stuff. And like, they tried everything, but they weren't, they didn't want to go on a drug. Like that was important to them. Right. And, the thing that they found, they found um, like it was an old house. There's like, you know, wallpaper and stuff. They found mm -hmm. so much black mold in this home mold. and they found mm -hmm. out that this was causing all these problems with them. And like somebody wanted to put them on drugs. And it's kind of wild yeah. if you don't like really get to the root cause. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Lisa Nagy, uh, Dr. Nagy, she's on, out on Martha's Vineyard, a uh, friend of mine, wonderful woman. She was a ER doc. And if I mess any of this up, Lisa, I'm sorry. But if I recall, she was an ER doc and she had the exact same issue where she was starting to have some mold toxicity issues. Nobody could figure it out. She didn't know about it at all because you're not trained as a medical doctor like that. And she was very knowledgeable, you know, well-versed, you know, medical doctor working in ER and uh, was really struggling. She was in the hospital, felt like she was literally dying. And this was chronic going on. Nobody mentioned it. And finally, somebody who was um, more of a environmentally uh, minded uh, in that field, and I forget the, the, the title that they have, um, came and said, you know, have you ever been tested for mold toxicity? And so they did that. And sure enough, that's what was going on. And wow. immediately, within weeks after, she started feeling better. And so she was so impressed by that, that she actually went back to school to learn about that and practice wow. that type of medicine now and gave up her career for it. So I think people really have to look and, and, and find something that works for them. You know, everybody called Tom Cruise crazy, you know, when he was jumping up and down on the couch and, you know, and really, you know, um, talking to Matt Lauer that time and, and saying, do you really understand that what these drugs do and that they really are poison in a way because your brain views them as poison and, and there's truth in that. Um, Tom knew exactly what he was talking about. He may not have been the most eloquent to say it and didn't uh, use all the right terminology and phrase and have the credentials after his name to say it, um, but he actually was on the right page you know, with that. Um, and it's kind of ironic how things come full circle. I mean, 20 years ago, I was talking about how antidepressants cause suicide and I was called a whack. I had a local psychiatrist in my little hometown you know, publicize, publicize in the local paper that nobody would believe this, no other doctor would agree with me, and that everybody knows that it's due to a chemical imbalance and genetic and all of that, and that they have to be drugged for this, and that no, these drugs don't commit, you know, cause suicide. And I'm like, here we are, you know, when, when the, uh, the research again is saying exactly what we knew back then. It's just that they deny, they deny, they try to discredit you, they attack you, um, and you just have to be persistent and know that there's uh, people out there who know better. Well, it's it's interesting because I feel like the more things change, they, the more they stay the same, right? I, th I think that's a lot of what we end up dealing with. Well, Dr. Watson, I've, I've really, really appreciated your time as I was really looking forward to this conversation. For people yeah. listening, if they want to connect with you, they want to you know learn more about what you're doing, what's going to be the best way for them to, to go check you out? Um. You know, I, probably Dr. To, Dr. Toby Watson com. That's my website. Um, if somebody wants to send me an email, that's a good way to do that. Um, I'm not doing a lot of more advocacy work right now because I'm kind of busy in a lot of the court case work that I do. Um, and I do a lot of concierge work. So I'm bouncing around the country or different places consulting with people. So that's a, a bit of a, of a challenge. Uh, we are working, though, on potentially uh, developing a television show. Um, oh, cool. Talking about these types of issues. Um, yeah, I've got a few producers interested. I've been back in Hollywood and back and forth um, in discussions about it. So we're trying to, you know, kind of a, a little more of a Dr. Phil meets Dr. Drew meets Dr. Oz um, with a bit of more humanity and humor um, and talking about more of the mental health aspect of all of these things that go on in people's lives. Well, Dr. Watson, I appreciate you being on today. Yeah. I know this was a, a quick turnaround because you and I literally connected like two days ago. So, yeah. so thank you for making this work uh, and uh, best of luck to you, sir. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a good day.